The following program is a paid presentation for American Medicine Today. The information and opinions expressed are solely those of American Medicine Today and are not the opinions of the station, its affiliates, management, or employees. Coming up on American Medicine Today, we speak with fisherman John Aldridge as he recalls the harrowing hours he spent overboard off the coast of New York. Then we walk the beach with former patient Patty Lorenz, who is excited to get back to the things she loves most after having received the exclusive procedures from the Bonatti Spine Institute. And finally, Dr. Bonatti discusses hospitals becoming big businesses. Who is better suited to manage our health care? Find out coming up on American Medicine Today. Featuring cutting edge science and medical innovations, touching personal stories of recovery from pain, and political issues plaguing our health care. This is American Medicine Today. Brought to you by the Bonatti Spine Institute and Alfred Bonatti, MD. Thank you for joining us on American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Bromell, joined by my friend Ethan Euchre. Glad to be here. And Jeff Wagstaff. Hello, everyone. Thanks and, for having me. Absolutely. And world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Alfred Bonatti. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you. So joining us right now is John Aldridge, a lobster fisherman near Long Island, New York, whose harrowing search and rescue mission at sea is chronicled in the new book, which is soon to be a major motion picture, A Speck in the Sea, a story of survival and rescue. Thanks for joining us, John. Thank you for having me. Pretty incredible story, John. Take us back to that night in 2013 wow. when you were swept overboard. It's a nine-hour ride out to our fishing ground. So we have uh, three guys on the boat. One guy stays awake and we rotate through the night. I was on watch. I was getting the boat ready to fish for the next day, and as I was moving a cooler on the deck to get to one of my tanks to do mm. just one of my valves, I pulled on the handle, and the handle had snapped, and I went flying out of the back of the boat in the middle of the night, about 2 o'clock in the morning. What time miles. of year, John? It was July. The water temperature was about 71 degrees. So at least the water wow. wasn't too bad. So uh, obviously you didn't have on a life vest? No, I did not have a life vest on. I had uh, fishing boots, a pair of shorts, and a T-shirt. Wow. So explain to everyone, how did you stay afloat? Because you must have been not for a loop when now you're in the water and you're thinking, I'm the only person awake on the boat. And the boat was continued on. How right? do I stay afloat? Yeah, the boat's on autopilot. I was panicking and basically, you know, I exhausted myself because of panic and fear. Right. I was about to drown. I, for lack of anything better to grab, I kicked my boots off and they floated up and I got another breath out of myself and something clicked in my head and said, let me empty these boots out and create an air pocket. So I emptied the boot and pushed it back into the water. I had a makeshift life jacket, be, you know. And your uh, crewmates didn't even realize until the morning, wow. obviously, like at least hours three, three, four hours later yeah. that you were missing. What was, I mean, what was their reaction when they fi uh, figured out that you weren't on the ship? Yeah, so my fishing partner, Anthony, he wakes up and I'm not on the boat. It's pure disbelief, you know. I mean, we've done this trip a thousand times. You're just so blown away by it. He was 60 miles offshore by the time he woke up. Wow. And I fell in about 40 miles. So he wakes up and immediately calls the Coast Guard and tells him what happened. Did the fishing boat then mm -hmm. circle around and try to... Backtrack. Follow its backtrack to see if they could find you, or what was there? Right. What did they do? Right, he turned the boat right around, went back down. It's you know the same track line that we came out on, but you know the ocean moves. Mm. Even if the boat <laughs> went from one point A to point B, the current in between moves that whole body of water. I can't imagine the panic you must have been going through because right away I think being in the water outside of a pool and I automatically go sharks I, I would mm. die yeah so about I guess an hour and a half after I realized I could float on my boots I was starting to assess the situation and here comes two shark fins I see come up around me about 15 feet away from me oh, and I pull out my little three inch pocket knife thinking that's going to do something mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh I hold tight, and I'm, you know, scared, scared to death. Something, you know, again, clicked in me. I, I got to calm my heart rate. I got to calm my breathing down so that they won't come check me out. And Just can't imagine how <laughs> scary that's got to be. You know, middle of the ocean, middle of the night, you see fins come up around you. Yeah. yeah. That, that's crazy. Wow. You got dive bombed by birds and things, too, didn't you? It wasn't just <laughs> yeah, sharks I mean, that were pestering you. Immediately as I hit the water, these storm petrels started dive bombing my head. It seemed like everything in the ocean knew I was there. You know, porpoise swim by. I had uh, ocean sunfish swim right up to me. I had to kick them off of me. That's 500-pound fish. Mm -hmm. When this fin came up, you know, I thought it was a great white shark or something. It was mm -hmm. huge. You talk about, you know, going inside your head and trying to picture something. What was that item 
that you were picturing during this time to try to calm yourself down? You try to get in your head, but out of your head. Okay. You know, you try to get in your head and try to calm yourself down, but you try, you, you, it's like you're almost looking out above yourself, looking down at yourself. You know, you want to calm yourself down and, and just like a mantra of it, of it, okay. just calm down, you know, breathe slow, mm-hmm. you know, and, and just work through it that way. In some of the uh, write-ups about your experience, didn't you picture, what was it, a vacuum? Vacuum cleaner? You know, all of these thoughts go through your head. You know, who's going to take care of my dog? You know, the vacuum cleaner. Or I left out on the on the deck overnight. Is it going to rain? You know, like all of these obscure <laughs> right. things you think about that just blow mm-hmm. through your brain. And is what occupies you your mind. Yeah. 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 John, it sounds like you were in the water quite a while. Mm-hmm. Take a step to what your thought process was, and eventually we're talking to you. Mm-hmm. So somebody had to find you. you Tell lived. us what yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've seen them searching for me. In the morning, I knew when, when Anthony woke up, I heard the helicopters in the distance. So I knew that they were awake, and they called the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard was out looking for me. Through the day, you know, my boat had passed me twice. Another lobster boat had passed me uh, wow. twice. How close the did, they, did they get to you, John? Because uh, that had maybe, to have been so frustrating. Maybe, maybe like 300 yards or something like that, you know. <sighs> and they couldn't see me, yelling, screaming, nothing. God. I read in some of the prep work that Ethan pulls prior to us talking mm-hmm. to a guest that eventually you found a buoy to cling to. That had to be a, like an angel. You know, I knew the area we were fishing in. I knew there was fishing gear in the area. So mm-hmm. that was, I figured, my salvation. Let me find a buoy. So I find the buoy, and I realize it's like holding a balloon. I can't get on top of it. If it was all I had, it would be enough to stay afloat, but it wasn't right. better than my boots. Okay. Um, so what I did is I turned it into more of a, a visible thing. You know, so I, I, could, I cut it off. There's more visibility. I swam more in the direction of where they were searching for me. I just had to get more closer to where I thought that they would be looking for me. Eventually found another buoy and tied the two of them together and sat in between them. Mm. Wow, and that's how they found you. Yeah, tell us about that moment that you were finally found, John. Yeah, you know, I'm sitting there another couple of hours figuring it's getting dark out. I'm watching the sun, you know, drop in the the sky through the day, and I didn't want to be in the open ocean again through the night. All of a sudden, here comes the Coast Guard helicopter right down the line of buoys and then i started waving and screaming and throwing the stuff in the air and uh he spun up off of me was hovering there and i knew he had seen me at that point so i had turned my back to them they had lowered down the rescue swimmer he had swam over to me and wow you know he was out of he was in such disbelief that he they found me and he said we you know we've been looking for you for nine hours today and that's when i told him i've been looking for you for 12 hours (laughs) (laughs) i think you had a long day try being me oh my gosh so what type of parting advice would you have for someone that's on these type of boats so they don't end up in your situation are there any survival techniques that you can bestow Uh, upon them well i mean complacency kills so you know don't be complacent and you won't be in that situation for one and you know life jacket you know you gotta wear your life jacket i'm a professional mariner and you know we haven't been doing that and now it's you know how can you not do it didn't your partner realize kind of the time frame at first he didn't and then he realized that You said you were going to meet or do something at around 3 in the morning, and that's what helped them kind of narrow the search area for you? When he had realized that the handle on the cooler was, you know, on the deck, that 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 is the reason why it had fallen overboard. It it was broken, and he picked it up. Mm -hmm. And he remembered that when we hit a certain point, this 40-fathom edge, we were going to start filling the tanks up. So... Mm -hmm. If I was going to fill the tanks, it would be around then. So I must have fallen off, you know, in around that, that area. Yeah. That helped a lot. That helped a lot getting the uh, Coast Guard not looking, you know, in a block of 20 miles that I really wasn't sure. in. Right. Yeah. Now, John, I understand they're making your story into a film. Do you know mm-hmm. any details about it? Who's going to play you? Anything like that? Any preferences? Because, you know, I'm, I'm up for the gig. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so am I, right? I mean, <laughs> but I don't think we're marketable enough. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Nobody knows who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. So <laughs> they're, they're hot and heavy on it now. Blumhouse Productions That's a big, has control big of it studio. now. It's going to be somebody very famous. So. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> they just haven't told me yet. Cool. Well, we can say when it comes out that we yes. talk to the actual guy in the yes. movie, so that's, that's exciting. Right. Thank God you're still here. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, well, thank sure. you for sharing such an important story with us. John Aldridge, lobster fisherman near Long Island, New York, whose harrowing search and rescue mission at sea is chronicled in the new book, which is soon to be a major motion picture, mm-hmm. A Speck in the Sea, A Story of Survival and Rescue. Thanks, John. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for having me. Have a great Absolutely. weekend. Absolutely. What Bye-bye. an incredible story. Make sure you stay tuned, because coming up after the break, our Back to Life segment.
Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Bonatti created, perfected, and patented the Bonatti Spine Procedures. Using his genius, Bonatti invented the precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect 98.75% patient satisfaction. 55,000 procedures have been performed exclusively at our two locations. Over half our patients have suffered from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. It would be an understatement to say that Patty Lorenz has had a hard time over the last 20 years. I live in Des Moines, Iowa. I used to have hobbies of working with wood and riding my Harley. I haven't been able to do that for two years. My hobby ended up being basically laying in bed in pain all day long and all night. My pain started in December of 96. Um, I had an accident at work and it broke the three lower lumbar and I had a laminectomy and a fusion and uh, I had metal in my back, uh, two rods and an H pin when I woke up. Patty's life changed dramatically after her fusion surgery. Simple tasks became impossible, and she became dependent on her family to help with everything. I did not have much movement at all. To learn how to walk again it was very hard. My kids, they had to grow up very fast. My daughter was six, and my son was nine, and they had to learn how to cook and take care of me. I couldn't do what? You know, I used to do. I'd fall up and down the stairs. During one of these falls, she sustained an injury to her neck, and she was now suffering with a pain along the entire length of her spine. Patty's husband, Scott, tells us about the struggles he and his family went through to care for Patty. Well, it made me sad because I, I couldn't do nothing to help her. She went to physical therapy in Osceola, and my daughter was with her. I was at work, and, and my daughter says, well, they told, my, told mom to touch her toes and bend over and the physical therapy guy pushed her head down and Patty says, well, she hurt, felt something give away at the back and that's when everything started going bad again. It came down to the point where I do not like physical therapists, I'm sorry. I had one that broke my bone graft. Over the years, Patty tried numerous treatment options to manage her pain. I was taking a lot of medications and then they started opiate therapies. I think the pain from coming off the opiates and then the pain I had, it doubled. And I also had a therapy of a uh, spinal stimulator. One of the leads after so many years came loose. One night I told my husband I wasn't feeling very well. It looked like I was having a stroke. I started going into seizures. They were caused by the uh, wire that came loose that was going all through my spine and I'm still taking seizure medication today. Despite her efforts, her condition never improved and Patty finally decided that she could no longer live in a constant cycle of pain and failed attempts at treatment. After so many years, I had to do something. I couldn't live that way anymore. So I tried finding places that could do something for me, help me. I was just about ready to give up. And I started backing out of the internet and all of a sudden, Bonatti Institute came up on my phone. And so I looked at it and read it. And I'm like, oh my God, Scott, this is where we need to go. We need to get to Florida. We need to, you know, I need to call and we need to go. And so I called. And Bonatti got on the phone instantly with me. And he says, I want you here ASAP. He says, we have Vegas and we have Florida, but I want to work on you. And I'm like, okay. And he says, my secretary will get back with you with when we can get you in. The next week we were here. And he looked at the MRIs. I have never, out of all these years, had a doctor that's seen my imagery and told me what I was feeling. He told me, and I, I was speechless. I mean, when he told me what was going down my leg, from what, I was, 
I was blown away. I couldn't believe it. Somebody understood what I was talking about. Somebody really understood me. It understood my body, I guess I should say, not me, my body, my spine. And it was a miracle to me. An important benefit of the Bonatti spine procedures is that they are performed with conscious IV sedation. What's that? I don't feel anything. Is that the move, like that? That's yeah. about it? Yeah. This anesthetic technique allows the patient to be a participant in their surgery, which ensures the surgeon eliminates the cause of the pain. It also gives the patient the opportunity to watch their procedure while it's happening. On the table, it was awesome. I got to see my surgery being done on my lumbar. You know, most people probably wouldn't say, awesome watching it. After all these years of suffering, I got to see what was making the problem. <laughs> and I got to see the nerves. But I think that's what made it so interesting is because I could feel everything he was doing and what the difference was making. And I could feel the relief when he got the pressure off the nerves right there and then. That was really awesome to watch, too, how they stretched that out, tube over tube over tube, you know, and through the, just this little incision. Another unique option at the Bonatti Spine Institute, a patient's loved one is able to stay by their side every step of the way, even while in the operating room. Scott explains what it was like while Patty was undergoing her procedure. Well, I was watching at the TV screen and, and he was grinding away on the bone and stuff like that, trying to get away from the nerves and stuff that was bothering her. And I just was thinking in my mind, well, that's probably some of that bone graft that that other doctor put in there. And that was her, all of her problem all through the years. And there wasn't nobody that wanted to mess with it after she had several different surgeries. And when we got up here and he was looking through the x-rays and stuff, I just, thinking to myself, oh man, he, it's God saying it. Though Patty is still working through her Benatti surgical summary, she has already experienced pain relief she never thought possible. I have control of my leg. It's not tripping over the other. I'm not feeling the pain going down my leg. My thoracic, I'm not having the pain coming around the front on my ribs. And the neck, I'm not getting the pain coming down and going across and making you feel like you're having a heart attack. This side finally has relaxed enough that my shoulder finally popped and it was the best relief I had ever felt. I haven't, my, my shoulder and my whole arm hasn't felt this good for years. As she said, she walked in there with a walker and the first surgery and and she got up out of that bed, and I was almost ready to cry. Now Patty is excited to get home and make up for lost time with her children, grandchildren, and husband. Going to Benati was the best thing that could ever happen. Um, I feel completely different. I feel like a new, new woman already. You know, I'm gonna be going home and my kids are older, and I got grandkids that are a little bit older, and they're gonna see a whole new grandma. I have a disabled grandchild, and he's getting tall enough that I can't hold him, but it got to the point where I couldn't have him on my lap. Now I can have him back on my lap again, and I can get my hugs and kisses. So th that to me is gonna be the most special thing in this world. Bonatti was the one that helped me completely. Thank you for giving my career back to me. Several people have asked me, what did you do, where did you go, who did you see? And I'm more than happy to tell them that the Bonatti Spine Institute is the place to go. He said, don't tell me, I'm gonna tell you what's wrong with you and tell me if I'm correct. And so he did. The good news this time is it was not open back surgery. So they did give me my life back. This car is this big. He was a doctor that didn't want to fillet my back open like a fish. During the whole operation, I was awake. I was talking to the doctor. I saw the operation in the monitor. 
and he's not really cutting muscles, he's just pushing them away. Immediately after the procedure, I was able to stand straight again, and I had zero pain. Well, he did the surgery on the left side, and a week later, I was back in the gym. Don't wait until you're on that downward slide where you can't even function anymore. Just don't wait, just get it done. When somebody can help you, to where you can recover and where you can do the things that you were able to do before, you just become thankful. I can't thank the Bonatti Institute enough for giving me my life back. It just opens up doors that you thought were closed. I love you, Doc. <laughs>
create the insurance companies. And then later on, they abandoned and the insurance companies got in, in the hands of the business. Doctors created the hospitals. And then later on, they, they, they got involved in management of healthcare and, and they abandoned and then business people took over. And we start to see the transition of these hospitals. Before when we, when we have community hospitals, it was a tremendous good care for these patients. I lived that life before. Sure. When I saw community, community hospitals, the, the community pay for that hospital and the patients stay in, in, in bed the time necessary to get better. When do you think that more doctors will kind of take the reins of medicine back and become in charge of these hospitals? Well, what, what do you think needs to happen for that to take we place? Need to, we need to have a strong, a strong leadership. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's no leadership in medicine. And the hospitals are practically gathering these physicians and putting the hospitals to be, to be like a little, little boys that are gonna do some service for them. But the major trouble is that is creating bad medicine for everybody. We have a great leadership in American Medical Association on the 40s. Uh, but then, then was totally dismantled when when they agreed to 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 help Medicare. Right, because of different coding that they give to the insurance companies. Worse than that, the, the, that one happened recently in the few years, next last last ten years, fifteen years or so. The the American Medical Association created a code system, mm -hmm. sold the code system to the insurance companies right. and to the government, and between those, they paid them millions of dollars to maintain this coding. What would happen, though, if this practice continues in the way that it's set up, and they alienate all the doctors and all the doctors leave medicine? Who's going to perform what needs to be done? The doctors are not gonna leave medicine Oh, they've because, left in droves. Yeah, but I'm talking about, they're not gonna leave medicine in that way. Okay. And doctors are gonna get old and they're gonna disappear or they're gonna resign and they're gonna say, but what is gonna disappear is the real doctor. Mm -hmm. What's gonna be replaced by a quote unquote medical provider. Okay. So when you replace the doctor from a medical provider, you're going to have individuals that they're going to be trained two years. Correct. Okay, and they're going to be called MDs. So those guys don't even know how to distinguish a tumor from a pimple. And that's a topic we could continue to talk about for quite some time. Thanks for joining us on American Medicine today. If you have any comments or questions, contact us at the number below. You can tweet at Dr. Benati using hashtag American Medicine Today or hashtag AMT. We would like to hear from you. The preceding program was a paid presentation for American Medicine Today. The information and opinions expressed are solely those of American Medicine Today and are not the opinions of the station, its affiliates, managers,